Welcome to another video in the Timco Retail Manager course. This course focuses on real-world application development. Right now, we are working on building out our first section of work, which is the basic register. In this video, we're going to set up our login form in WPF. Now, if you're a Patreon supporter at the $5 per month level or higher, make sure you head over to get the latest source code. Either way, make sure you're subscribed to this channel so you can be following along. Okay, let's get started. Now here I have opened the project that we're working on. And just for good form, I don't normally do this on a video, I forget to do it. But if you go to sync and just do a fetch to make sure there's no uh, commits out there we have not pulled down, there's not because I'm working solo, therefore I'm the only one making commits. So now we know that we have the latest version of our source code, we can get to work. Let's start by setting the desktop UI project to be a startup project. And now in here, we can start working on, let's start with our shell view and shell view model. If we hit start on this right now, just see what happens. It should launch up our shell view, which it does. If we notice up in the upper left hand corner here, it says shell view, kind of small, but we can see it. And that just indicates that this shell view model is what's getting kicked off and it's opening up the shell view, which is at this point empty. So we're going to make some changes here. We're going to add a login form and we're going to have to populate that with a couple of controls for username or email address and password and a button to say submit. Now, the first thing you need to do is figure out how this is going to interact with the shell view. We've got to figure out, is the shell view going to open up first or should the login form open up first? And I think in this case, and usually in most cases, I want to open up the shell view first because the shell view is named shell view for a reason. Typically how you use this is this is just a shell that then you can open up forms inside. Think of, well, in this case, Visual Studio is a pretty decent example, not the best, but it's a pretty decent example because the Visual Studio, the outside stuff, stays open all the time. And then we open up windows inside of it. And so we don't think about closing down the main window, which is Visual Studio itself, and then using something else, you know, next. Because that wouldn't make sense. When this main window closes, all of Visual Studio closes down. That's the same thing that's going to happen with our application. Whatever form we start with, when that form closes, the application closes. Now, there are ways around this. For example, you could have a login form first, and then when they successfully log in, you could hide the form and then open up what would be your main form from there. But we're not going to do that. Instead, what will happen is we'll open up this main form and then we'll have it immediately go to the login form. And that login form will be right inside of this shell view, kind of like a, a child, a parent child relationship. Okay, so that's how I'm going to set it up, which means that this shell view model needs to be set up to handle one or more views. So the next question that comes up is, are we going to have multiple views on this same page at the same time? And I think I want to keep it simple and say, no, I'm just going to have one view and it's going to be whatever form I want to load. So I'm going to leave it at one view and one view only. And that means I can set my shell view model to inherit. And let's use the Caliburn micro. So using caliburn.micro, we're going to inherit from conductor of type object. And this is the simplest way of doing it. You could be much more specific in which type of object you want to use, but I'm going to say, I don't want to worry about it. I'm just going to say object. So I can put whatever object I want in there. And I just know to put only um, view model classes in this conductor. So that's just 
my personal, you know, ease of use kind of thing, I could dial it right down to just certain types or even create an empty interface and say only those items, but I'm going to leave it an object and, and be fine with it. Okay. So that's what's going to allow us to display one form on here somewhere, but it doesn't have to get the entire form. And in fact, what I'm going to do is come down here and let's, let's uh, flip this around. So you have a little more screen real estate. WPF does not yet have a great story for, for the day for layouts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut the grid out. Control X. And instead, I'm going to add a dock panel. And a dock panel allows us to dock things in different positions inside of it. So I'm going to create a menu. And I am going to say dock panel dot dock. I'm going to dock it to the top. What this will allow us to do is it will allow us to put a menu at the very top that says, okay, these are the things, you know, for example, file under file, you have exit um, and all the rest. And one of them will be somewhere either on the main menu or under the menu somewhere will have login. That way, if you ever wanted to log out, you could, and we can also allow you to then uh, log in again or something to that nature. So we're just going to, let's just create one for, for now. We'll say menu item and the, the header is going to be file. And actually we'll do an underscore in front of the F, which that underscore allows us then to um, use the alt key and then hit F and it'll open the file menu. Now, right now, Let's zoom back to 100% since it's tiny and move over. It's still very tiny. The, uh, the file is very small. If I were to change the font size up here, we would change it for the entire form. Let's just say eight, oops, 18 point font. Notice even with that huge font, it doesn't change anything. The, the menu, for whatever reason, does not inherit from the, the window. I'm not a big fan of that, but no worries. What we can do is say font size right in the menu and let's say 18 and notice that file got significantly larger. Okay. So this is the start of our menu system and let's just add, oh, I don't know, one more menu item. And let's just say the header is underscore account. And then in here, we'll have a menu item for um, login slash logout. So let's say that the menu item is going to have an, a name. I didn't name the other ones because I have no reason to refer to them directly in code. But for this one, I'll, I'll name it. I'm going to call this the uh, login screen. And we'll say that the header for this is going to be login. And we'll change that to be log out, probably. You know, so if you're logged in, it'll say log out. Or if you're not logged out, it'll say log in. That's a possibility, um, but it does. We'll have to play around with this and see if this works. Otherwise, what we can do is create a second menu item and just hide it by default. And have me log out and then swap which one is visible. It's another option to do as well. But for now, we won't give it any type of um, action. So there's no code behind this for now. So you can see over here the file and the about. And if we were to drop down, you'll see the login is right here as well underneath the account menu. So that's a pretty simple. Uh, menu instead of a doc panel. Now at the end of menu, before the doc panel closes, I'm going to paste my grid that I cut out originally. And so this is where the rest of the stuff goes. Notice it's, 
it's everything below our menu item. If you see the dots here, they're kind of small, but it indicates these are the, this, the area for this grid. And that's everything below our menu. Okay, so now we have a start. Let's go ahead and build out our grid a little bit to lay out our structure for our form. There's not much structure to it. Essentially, it's just this spot right here, which means that unless you want to add something else around it, maybe one of those uh, status bars at the bottom, kind of like what we have down here, we could do that if we wanted to. But I think for now, we'll just leave it at the rest of this form, which means in here, we can add is a content control. And we'll give a name of active item. And let's give it a margin all around. And let's just say that the margin is going to be, let's just start with five. And that should be good. So now in here, and I didn't have to put this grid, I could have just dumped it right dumped content control right inside of where the grid's at. But the grid allows me a little bit more flexibility if later I want to come back and add something else in. All right, so it shouldn't have changed anything except for when we start this, we should see that we have a file menu with nothing underneath it, which we do, and then an account menu with a login underneath it. And that's it. So we're getting a good start now what we need to do is actually create our control to put in here. So let's create a new view model. So class, we're going to call this the login view model. I'm going to get public. And let's go ahead and also create the login view control. So user control, user control, and we'll call this the login view in order to match up with the login view model. So now let's work on this form. Now, right now it's, it's gray because it's actually transparent. Let's change that, at least for now, so the background's white. We can take this off later. I usually do this for design time at least. You can do it for run time as well. The only problem then is if you decide to change your color scheme, maybe you want to change your background to a little bit of a gray or maybe a little bit of a blue or something like that where it's subtle but it actually makes a little bit of a difference in your app. Well, then you have to change on every single form. Whereas if you leave it, leave this off, the background is transparent, and then you only change it in your shell view, and you can change it everywhere then. So for design time at least, or for development, we will leave this at white. We may change it later. Now the design height and width is set at 450 and 800. If you remember, if you go back to the shell view, the design height and or the height and the width is 450 and 800. So those actually match, which means that we'll actually lose some, some of our height because if this is 450 and includes the menu bar, we don't have 450 to give to our login form. But WPF is very flexible. And so we want to actually kind of take that into account when we build our form. We don't want our form to be pixel perfect at only one size. We want it to grow and shrink as necessary. So I'm not going to take the entire uh, space up with my login form, but I want it to look good at a roughly this size. Now this is design height and design width because this control will fit to whatever you put it into. So it's actually a little bit shorter, like I said. So we could actually just kind of simulate that with our height. We get 25, we get a little bit smaller, so 425. And again, this is just simulating, so I have something. 
Now in this grid, we actually want to set up our rows and columns. So grid dot column definitions, and then also grid dot row definitions. So column definitions are the vertical slices we do. We want a couple of those, probably just two, I think, at least for now. So let's do our column definition and we'll set it at, you know, I think we're gonna set it at actually star and do four columns total. So the columns have width, so this is star, and then, whoops, we'll do slash and close it out. I'm gonna copy this and paste it a few more times. It's gonna curse in the right spot. And now for these two, I'm gonna say auto. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna allow me to center my content so that it's gonna take, take up just whatever space it needs in the exact center we're talking about horizontally, okay? So the left-hand margin and right-hand margin, if you were, will be exactly the same width as each other, and the content will be in between those two columns at whatever width it needs. Let's do the same thing or something similar I'm trying to debate here. I think actually we're not gonna do the same thing for height. For height, I think what we'll do is we'll start at the top and work our way down and then have the rest be just that star spacing. So let's do grid.row definitions. And we'll say row definition. Our first one, the height is going to be auto. And then we'll copy that. And we'll need one for our, you know, our login form header, whatever we're going to save for that. We'll need one for our row for um, the uh, username and one for the password and the last one for the button. And then the one after that is going to be star. Okay, so that's our, our row definitions. Now we can do is come down here and actually start uh, parse this out. So let's flip this over to our other layout and kind of shrink this up a little bit. And in fact, we can shrink it down pretty good because of the fact that we really want to work with just what's on this center line. So inside here, what we'll do is we'll set up a text block. And this is going to be our header. And so we'll say that it is on grid.row. It's in the first row, so zero. And grid.column, it's in column one, the second column. And grid.column span is two, meaning it's on two columns actually. It's on column one, which is this one, and column two, which is this one. And the horizontal alignment is going to be center. What that will allow us to do is center our text. And we're going to say that, let's just say login form. Now notice, if you can see it, it's really tiny. It's right up here at the top. Let's change that. So font size. Let's make this 48. That sounds good. And for font family, I'm going to actually go into the properties. It's just easier, I, I find. And let's go with something light. Yep, that'll work. And let's actually change that, that font size then to be something a little bit bigger. Not six pixels. 64, how about that? There we go. So now we have something a little bit larger. This kind of jumps off the page at you. This is a login form. And now what we can do is set up our, our two entries, which would be our, um, our text blocks. So let's do this. Let's actually mark it off. 
This is our username row. And we'll say, first of all, text block. And this is on grid.row1, grid.column1. Inside here, we will say username, like so. And that's awful small. I'm going to change it up here at the user control level to say our font size is going to be 18 to match what we have on our shell view. That still looks a little small. Let's actually change this to 24 to see how it looks. I think that's probably better. So let's leave it at 24. And let's also put some padding underneath the login form so we're not right up against each other. So the text block, I'm going to say the uh, margin is going to be 0, 0, 0. And the last one, let's do... Let's do 20 and see what it looks like. I think that's probably good. That gives us some space between login form and username. And now we can, on the next line down here, we'll say text box. That's where you actually enter data. And we're going to give it a name of username and we'll say that our grid.row is row one and grid.column is column two. And let's start there for now. That's gonna put it right over here, but it doesn't look very big. Let's look at that, not very big. So let's look at if we can increase that. So let's say minimum width. Let's give it a 100. And that seems a little better if we look at that like so. It's a little bit bigger. I think that's more in line with what we want to see. Okay, so that's our username row. And now we can do is we can give some padding or some margin below each of these. So let's do that. Not 20, I don't think. Let's just do 10. Like so. And let's do the same thing here. Where you say 10 below this as well. And now for the next row, let's actually bring it back over here. Now we can say password row. And down here, you can say text block. In fact, you know what we're going to do? We're going to copy and paste this thing. Only a row is row two, column is column one, and this is password. So now we can do is we can actually copy this text box as well and paste it down here and set the row to be two, column is fine. Not a text box though. And also username, let's need to change the password. But we don't want text box because of the fact that that will display the text right on the screen. So how about password box instead? And that should put stars in that box instead. We'll make sure it does what we intend it to do. Next, let's create our login button. Login row, let's call that. And say button grid.row equals three, grid.column equals one, and grid.column span equals two. I want to center this button right in the middle. So the horizontal alignment equals center. Let's actually put this to the next row. And we do need to give it a name. Login button. We have the login command if we wanted to, or 
uh, action or something like that, but login button works at least for now. And then inside here, we'll just say log in. And we should give it some margins too, because this is tiny. Uh, actually, some padding, sorry. Not password box. Padding. Let's give it a padding of, let's look at five and 10. Oops, got those reversed. How about 10 and five? There we go. Let's actually make this more like 20 to give it a, a bigger feel here. So now what we have is a very simple login form. Username, password, click the login button. We don't have clear form. We don't have forgot password. We just have login. And I think this is where we're gonna stop, not in this video, but as far as designing this form, because I think that this gives us really all we need at this point to do the bare functionality of what this form will do. The form will probably grow over time and we could probably also style it as well in order to give us a better look, maybe have an image on the login button and, and things like that. Maybe even an image at the top here for login form, just to give it a little bit more life to this form instead of a bare stark form. But to get something working, I think this works. I think that it's enough. I do think that looking at these, I'm thinking I want to make these a little bit bigger. That's one thing that kind of jumps out at me as maybe a little small. Let's try 150. That looks a little better. Notice how they it rearranged so it's still centered under login form. Love that. Love the fact that the button is still centered underneath the two. So it really does look nice. All right. And we could actually, let's look at what it looks like at 20 instead of 10. I think that, again, visually breaks it up a little bit and says, okay, these two are together. Then you get a space in order to log in. So I like that. I think it's a good first pass at this form. It allows us to get something in and working and then we can make it pretty if you want or, or bring our designer in to make it look nicer. But for now, I think it looks great. So now we can do is let's actually load this form when the shell view starts. So the first thing you do is create a constructor. Now in here, we need to ask for our login form. So we have this login view model. We need to open it at some point. In fact, we need to open it right away. So let's ask for that. So let's create a holder for it. So login view model underscore login VM and not assign anything to it. Make it private. And then here we'll say login view model login VM. Okay. And then we'll say underscore login VM equals login VM. Now this uses constructor injection. So I'm just saying, you know what? Give me a view model. I'm not going to do equals new VM anywhere if I could help it. So I'm saying just give me a login view model and put it in this parameter when you call the constructor. I'll store it in a private variable. And I'm actually going to activate item and the view model I'm going to activate is going to be the underscore login VM. Now I could say login VM as well. It would work because remember we're just passing around the address to that house's location. We're not actually passing around a copy of the house. So with this versus this, they're the same thing under the behind the scenes. So let's say activate item, which is going to immediately activate that login on our shell view model. So we use a constructor injection to pass in a new instance of login VM. 
and then I'm activating it immediately after storing it so I can use it later. If we run this, hopefully it all runs. It does, and immediately I have a login form. So now I can put in my username, test at test.com, and that's, that is not long enough, so we have, to, we have to make an adjustment there. And then my password is, notice it's not even showing me, it's just typing in those, those round um, indicators to indicate that a letter has been typed, but not which one. And then I can hit login, which does nothing at this point. But now we have a login form that opens right away when we uh, load this application. Now, if you're not familiar with the magic that really happened there, it's not magic. What happened was we're doing uh, dependency injection. Dependency injection, once you start using it, once you wire it up, it's awesome. Because I didn't have to say equals new here. I just said, give me, and it did. And the reason it did is because in the, inside the bootstrapper, we have this code for a simple container. And then here under the configure, we said, okay, we want to set up a couple of things. First of all, I window manager, and then I event aggregator. But then also I did this code right here where I said, Give me all the types that are a class that ends, the name ends with view model. Well, shell view model, that's one. Login view model, that's another. So those classes, list of them, and then for each one, register per request, meaning give me a new instance every time I request it, the type and the, uh, the name. So it registered login view model as one of those. So then when I request it over here, it said, oh, I know what to do. You want a login view model instance. And so it gave me that. Now the rest, when it actually displayed the login view, that's Caliber and Micro. This Caliber and Micro says, when you load a login view and say activate it, what you're actually asking for is for me to show you the corresponding view. So it says login view model, so login view model, sorry. So login view model has to have a login view. That's the naming convention. So view model lines up with view. It says, okay, that's the view to show. And that what it's connected behind the scenes is the login view model which by the way, we have not yet connected. So let's do that now. So let's set this up as a screen, which is using Caliber Micro. So I did control dot and hit enter. Now, if you've not typed this correctly and you hit control dot, you're not gonna get the option to add the using statement. You're just gonna get the option to create something new. You don't wanna do that. Okay. So now let's create a couple of properties. One property is going to be called username and the other password, if I remember right. Let's just check real quick. So our login form has a username, which is username, and the password is password. And actually, I cased those incorrectly capital U and capital P. The reason why they should be capital is because I'm actually gonna wire these up to properties. So prop full, I hit tab twice. And I'll say this is a string and this is gonna be underscore username, which corresponds to username. Okay, and that's our get for username. But our set, we're actually going to need to change. So let's hit enter a couple times here and get this format properly. Once we set a value, we also want to do the notif notify of property change. And do this syntax, which is to indicate that this property has changed its value. So every time we change a username value, 
it's going to fire off and say, hey, everybody, we changed the username value. And then we're going to do the prop full again, tab twice, string underscore password, give the name password, and do a similar type of thing. We'll say, okay, let's go ahead and do the notify of property change. for the password. Now I'm gonna move this private backing field up to underneath the username. I did that poorly. Okay, so now we have our private backing fields up here. We have our public properties for username and password. Now I don't wanna modify these directly, just so you know. I always want to go through the modification process on the actual property because that's what fires off the notify of property change. Also, if I had any mechanism in here to gate what comes in, meaning uh, not allow certain things. For example, maybe I don't want to allow an age to be less than zero. You know, that would be a, an indication there. So I'd say if age is greater than or equal or value is greater than or equal to zero, go ahead and apply it. You can't do that on these private backing fields. So I want to make sure that I never actually use these directly. And so I use the underscore syntax, which is pretty common. The underscore syntax says this is a private backing field, meaning its sole purpose is to supply and hold the value for this property. We match the names up and just use a different case and the underscore in front. So that's why I do that type of format in order to better indicate what we're doing here. Now let's create some code for our button, which our button is called what? Login button, let's actually change the casing on that as well. It's a login button. So let's create a couple things here. First of all, a public bool. And let's actually change it from login button to log in. That's better. Log in, that's the action it's doing. That way we can say can log in. And we'll pass in our username and our password. And as again, it's going to be convention based. So it's saying I'm reliant on username, which matches up with username and password, which matches up with password. But again, the casing is for parameters, which get the camel casing. So can log in, I'm going to say if username dot length is greater than zero and password.length is greater than, let's say zero, that's fine for now. Return true. Actually, let's set the a Boolean here. And set the output here equals true and return output. Okay, so this is just saying, as long as you have a username of length greater than zero and a password length greater than zero, it's valid. Now, is that good enough? Probably not. We probably wanna do a check on this to make sure that it's, the username actually is an email address and so it has to have an at symbol and a dots you know, in there somewhere after the at symbol or maybe even do a, a more comprehensive email check, which we can do uh, with some built-in .NET controls. And then password, maybe say the password has to be a length of, of six or eight, or whatever our standard password length is. But for now, I think this works and I'm not overly concerned with it. So can login returns a Boolean. That's going to enable or disable our login button public void login takes in a username and password again convention based 
So it's going to wire those two up for us behind the scenes. Caliber and Micro is. And now from this, we could do something interesting or we can just... Um, we could do a message. I was going to do just a console write language. Which actually, it does nothing. Okay. But I'm going to put a breakpoint here just to indicate that, yes, we logged in. Let's just start this up. And come over here. And notice login is grayed out. If I put test for username, nothing happens. If I type T, it should update, but it has not yet. Let's find out why. So let's put a breakpoint on the first line of our can login. Let's start again. And it immediately hits it. And of course, username is blank, password is blank. That's expected. But now if we hit T, username, the value is T, if you notice down here, and password, of course, is blank, which is fine. Let's hit continue. Let's hit T for password. Nothing happens. So that's not notifying us of any change to our password. Let's find out why password is not being updated. So password is our name. And over here we have our name for our password box is password. And it's spelled the same. There's no spelling errors there. So it seems like it would work. So I did a little bit of research and looked around and I found this article on Stack Overflow. If you haven't used Stack Overflow before, it's an excellent tool for finding information. Now, this is also a pretty decent definition of how to ask for help. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. So for example, first of all, the user actually has a name here, Dave, not just a number. That indicates you actually gave some sort of thought to your profile besides just saying, give me help. Also, there is clear definitions of what's going on, what version of Caliber and Micro they're using. There's tags here, and it's asking very clear question. Does Caliber and Micro support password box? So it's very clear what they're asking for, and because of that, he got not one, but two different great answers. And in fact, we look here, this answer, even though it's the selected one, the accepted one has two upvotes, whereas this one down here has nine. There's a reason for that. This one, I believe, came later. Let's say it's June 4th of 2015, June 26th of 2015. So this one came quite a bit later, but notice here's a much more simplified example. We like simple. And essentially, this is copy and paste with a little bit of modification. So it says, create this class password box helper, and then in your bootstrapper, run this code. So I think we'll do that and try it out. So I'm gonna copy first of all this code right here, which we do have to make one modification to. So this is called password box helper. Notice down here in the comments, comments are important. We see that we have to add this particular extra line at the end. So we'll do that in just a minute. So copy this code, it's called password box helper. I'll move this off a of screen. And now you have to decide where you put these things. Let's actually create a folder called helpers. And inside here, we'll add a class called password box helper. And then I'll actually paste over everything here and create this layout. And of course, we've got some red squigglies, but it should be we need to add some using statements and that's all it is. And it looks like the only thing it does is it's yelling at us a little bit because of our conventions, which is okay. Um, it's just saying, hey, we could do this better. And I believe the convention is, yeah, it wants to collapse it right into an if statement. 
um, which makes sense with a newer version of C sharp. It didn't make sense earlier. That's okay. Also, our if statements do not have curly braces. I don't want to leave that alone. I do want to change that because my convention is to have the curly braces and I don't want to have mixed types. Um, so then we have this right here. Looks like reflections, what is needed there. I think we're good now. Let's do a build here. Just to make sure that it all builds. And it does, which means we've got at least the, the issues of this solved. And now I need to look at um, that note a little more closely, which as let's um, zoom in here. There we go. So as Cosmo zero points out, add the file lines, the last line in the password change function. And that is this right here. Okay, so I'm gonna copy this line all the way through to this end here. Then copy this line and paste it at the end of password change. So let's do that. So let's copy this entire line. And what this does is it makes sure that the uh, caret does not go to the beginning every time you type, which is kind of important. All right, so I'm gonna move this back over here and in the password changed, we need to add at the end here, this line, which is actually, oh, there we have it here. So we can actually just delete that line out, which that was shift delete by the way. If you select the line, whether it's blank or not, and you hold down shift and then hit delete, it deletes the entire line. It makes it a little bit faster to go through and delete lines. So that's already there. So it's going to move the last character in the password box. Cool. So now what we need to do is we need to go to our bootstrapper. And in the initialize, we need to paste some code. Now let's copy it on the screen where you can't see it and paste it in here. And it should be that this works. We hit control dot add the using statement for Windows controls. And another one for where that helper is. And we should be good to go. Let's just try it right off the bat and see what happens. First, I'll make sure it builds and runs. That's always helpful. And it's still it's still spinning trying to lo or load. So this might not be, oh, that's because I have a breakpoint there. Let's go ahead and run this. Okay, so now if I type test, I type T, nothing happens. So that didn't solve our problem, it wasn't magic. Let's do a little debugging. I wonder if the issue is actually that it's not coming through here, but it is actually being updated. So what I'm gonna do is start this up again. And this time I'm gonna put some values in the username, move to my password box, but first come over here and put a breakpoint in can login and just type something which doesn't re register anything. But then if I hit T at the end of test, the password is empty. The username has something in it, but let's look at what password has in it. And notice that password actually has the word test in it. So it is registering that value it's just not triggering the can log in message. So we know the username, we know the password, it's just not triggering can log in. So now all we need to do is figure out what to do to trigger this can log in. So let's look first, let's put our breakpoint at the password notify property change. And Actually, let's put our breakpoint still at the can login, hit continue, and bring our form back up. And now I'm going to type, let's type the value R in our password box. And it does go and notify a property change for password, but it does not trigger the can login, which is interesting. Okay, so what if we did this? 
And I'm just guessing here at this point. I'm just trying to debug on the fly without necessarily going to Google for everything. But what if I just said can log in here for notify a property change? And of course it says no, can't do that because you've actually got a username and password string here. So what if instead I said can log in with username and password? Let's just see if that would work. All right, so there's no breakpoints right now. They're going to interfere. So test and T, E S T, it didn't actually run the can login or it didn't make a difference in our can login. So if I put a breakpoint at output here, come back to my thing and said uh, R, it does trigger it. And the username is test and the password is test R. And so it's going to come down through here and say true. If I hit continue, it still doesn't change this over to be able to be logged in. So let's work through a few more things. This is really what debugging looks like. Now, you know, we can always Google Stack Overflow. You can always even ask a question on Stack Overflow, but really, what it comes down to is you're just passing the buck. Now, I am not against asking questions on Stack Overflow, but I am against asking questions on Stack Overflow first. Okay. If you've not spent a couple hours trying things, not just confused, trying things, you haven't spent at least a couple hours trying things, you should not be asking questions of somebody else because you haven't put in the effort and really this is where the effort of this will pay off later when it comes to the next debugging challenge you come up against. So we don't want to just say, oh, it can't be done. Let's look at other options for this. I believe one of the options we have is instead of doing this, actually, let's just do like so. And we're going to take this off. We're going to cut this out and do a get. I believe we can do it like this and say, let's just change this to be look at our property and this to look at our property and we'll trigger this just like it would another property. So can log in. I'll do the same thing here. Let's try that out and see what happens. And it says obvious reference not set to an instance of an object returns null. So username is null, password is null. Therefore, the length cannot be greater than zero. Why is that? Because we have not set the initial values for these two things to be anything other than null. Let's do that here. Let's start again. And this time it starts up just fine. And let's just say T E S T password of T E S T. Nothing happens. Let's find out why. Let's look at can log in and we'll put a breakpoint at our Boolean here. And now let's just type something in the password box. Nothing is happening. If I type something in the username box, something does happen. Now, let's just out of curiosity sake, look at what happens. It does not enable this. So let's put our breakpoint back again and type something else. And now let's look at username. The length is greater than zero. Password, the length is zero, which is interesting. I wonder why. Because we had been setting that password just fine. So let's put our breakpoint back at password and make sure that it is in fact setting the value for password to something. So let's hit continue and let's change the value of our password at T at the end and nothing is happening when we set our value here. Notice it also makes this, this box larger, which is interesting. So why is it no longer triggering this when before it was? And the answer is, I don't know. 
Let's look at our code. So what has changed here? Well, we changed this right there. That would affect password in some small way. But that's only when the, the view model is initially created that it sets the value. After that, it sets it here. So we should be good there. And then we also change this to this um, right here. So let's actually comment this out entirely. And let's, of course, comment out where it's called. And let's just see if we capture the password value change. So I'm going to type something in here. Still not capturing that password value change. Well, that's because they didn't put the breakpoint in the right spot. That would really help. Let's try it again. Still not capturing that password change. Now, if we put the breakpoint on the username, whoops, it actually captures the username value and now it's updated. And the username is SD and we're good to go. So it does recognize that. In fact, if we type one more letter, let's look at the password field and it is empty. So there's no value there yet. So that's still not working correctly. Let's take the equals something off. Let's try it again. So we'll type something in our password and this time it works. So this is the value is, it's kind of small, but it's down here, it says T. So the issue was that when we initially assigned it a value that caused a problem, probably with our uh, customized password box helper. So what we can do instead is put our code back that we commented out. And that's why we commented out instead of just deleting it. And now what we can do is just make sure that the length or the username and password are not null. Okay, so I believe we could do this. Put a question mark after username. So it would say it would fail if it's not. And yep, that works. So we type test -E t, and now we have an enabled button. Okay, so a lot of work to get through to get there, and that was not contrived. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know that the password box would cause that problem. I didn't know how to fix it. And so I want to keep that on video because of the fact that you really have to go through that iteration. A couple of important things to learn out of that debugging experience. First of all, breakpoints are your friend. In fact, we haven't hit this one yet. We need to make sure that was going to work. But the other thing is that when I said, oh, we broke something, I didn't just give up on the code that I've gotten so far. I just said, okay, what broke it? And I thought it was this code down here and changing this over to a property, but it wasn't. Instead, the issue was setting this equal to an empty string. So my assumption was wrong. And so I was essentially abandoning code that wasn't broken. But because it broke when I put that code in, I thought that was the problem. Instead, it was a minor little thing I changed as well. So don't just abandon everything because something doesn't work. You might have gotten 95% of the way towards a solution. You just need that other 5%. So that's an important note. Um, commenting things out and re, you know, putting them back in helps. The undo helps. If I had been doing more git commits, then I would have been able to roll back with git. That's another option. Um, you can also, you know, like I said, use the undo button and go back quite a bit as long as you haven't closed out that tab. So that's another option. But all in all, what it came down to was just keep poking at it. Now, I'm not positive we're fully working yet. I still need to put a breakpoint here and make sure that we're working. So test and test the password as well. Now let's just say 
Um, and that works too, by the way. Clearing out disables a login button. Let's type in Corey for the password. Hit login and it goes right to the uh, login screen. But notice the username is test, the password is blank. But the password property is correct. I don't need to pass in now these username and password. I can clear these out because I can just say, I'll read the properties. Okay, so if I type Tim in the first in the login name or username and Corey in the last in the password name and I hit the login, it goes to the login method and if I read the username, it's Tim, password is Corey. So it is properly loading all the information. The assumption for how it's going to do it had to change, but the end solution is one that I can definitely live with. Now, I did use this question mark syntax, which I wasn't sure was going to work, but it does. Um, it, it's one of those things I'm still trying to wrap my brain around all the places I can use this. But essentially, this is a null check. So I'm saying if username is not null, look at the length property and then do this comparison. But the, the question mark I had was the question mark, um, not intentional. The question I had was, OK, but what if this is null? Well, at that point, what it's going to do is say, no, it's null. Therefore, that fails. OK, so. The password initially was null, actually so it was a username. And so this failed, so it never set it to true. It was only when they both were not null and the lengths were greater than zero that this passed. Okay, so that was an easier way of doing that than putting a separate if statement in here that wraps this entire thing that says if username equals null or is not equal to null and password is not equal to null, then run this inner if statement. This just makes it makes short work of it. And that was the design behind that um, that character is that we can use this to say if it's not null, then check the property of it. And you can even go, you know, nested three or four deep if you had three or four deep properties to make sure that each step along the way they're not null. And if they are, then it fails. Okay? In, inside an if statement, that failure just means it does not pass the if. Okay, so I think that's it. We now have a working login form that gets us to the point, we don't need this line anymore. It gets us to the point where we at least have the login button firing when a user puts their username and password in the box. Okay, so it, we start up, we start up with the login form because that's the first thing you want to see and yet it's not the, the actual shell view, I meaning it's not the first form we see. Therefore, we can close this form and not close our application. Because technically, the shell view is our application, and that's where we have our menu, and we have the ability to do other things once we're logged in. Okay, so that's enough for this video. That's, that's what we, we did. We, we set out to do, which is to create that form and get it wired up to start. We have not wired up the login button itself to do anything yet. That's the next video. So the next video is where we actually have some fun. Um, not that this wasn't fun, but I love talking to APIs. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to wire up this login button so that it calls out to the API with the username and password and says, is this valid? If it is, It'll come back with the credentials. We'll store the credentials and let the shell view know, hey, we're logged in as Tim Corey. Here's all the information you need to make future calls. Okay, so we'll do all of that in our next video. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching. As always, I am Tim Corey.